welcoming packs when you sign up. You're getting stuff mailed to you or faxed to you or emailed to you. And a lot of these are generated by different business systems that are often pre-existing in, in the company, and they may generate different formats. They might generate PDFs or PostScript or uh, AFP documents or any number of things. Um, they may be the kind of old system you don't want to touch and you don't want to risk breaking. Um, and, but you know, they may no longer meet your needs and they may not integrate very well together. So we sit below and we're taking all these documents. You can see they're generating and marked in different colors there. Hopefully you can read from the back. I think I can see the colors from here. Um, and we may be taking um, some electronic attachments and then we do a whole bunch of processing and sorting and grouping. So we might grab all several documents from different systems that are all intended for the same person. We'll group them together. Um, might convert all of them to double-sided. Um, you can put one document onto the back of another document. Um, then you can filter them and say, you know, we don't want any envelope to be over 50 grams, so if it's got too many sheets in it, split it across two, and so on. Um, we can do stapling, merging, sorting, um, all kinds of stuff. But basically, we're taking as input some kind of electronic document stream, and we're doing some kind of processing on it, and then coming out the other end um, to to an output device. Um, along the way, we can also do a whole bunch of enrichment. So we can add uh, barcodes on there. We can add data matrix. We can add marketing messages. So if there's some white space on the documents, you can add a little uh, customized marketing message for the user. Um, we can also add these OMR codes, which are these black stripes you'll see down the side of um, letters that you get. And they're codes that are used to control the folding machines and the envelope stuffing machines and so on along the way. And also to sort of make sure that all the pages have gone in. Um, so there are codes to that equipment. And again, we can have that. And then finally, on the output end, um, this is showing uh, a stream here of several different kinds of input documents coming in that are ready to go to be mailed out. Um, and that could be, uh, it could be actually mail, it could be by email or fax or by some other mechanism. And so in this case, it looks like they're going out to real mail. We've got envelopes, and we've got some pre-printed materials. So you might have flyers that are being inserted, and that's done again by this uh, insert machine. And um, we will select the appropriate output devices for different things. So if it's color, it needs to go to a certain printer. If it's black and white, it might be cheaper to send it to a different printer, and that sort of thing. So we'll route it to the output devices um, and send them out to the spark for them to make sure it gets put into the correct Um, and so what's the value of this? Um, the, one of the big ones is the value of the postal contracts. So with the European Postal Services opening up the competition, um, the postal contracts are now asking you to do the work for them and they'll give you a better rate. So if you can give them all the mail already sorted and grouped by postcode or even uh, grouped by mail delivery route, um, they'll give you a better rate. If you can guarantee a certain volume and you can put them in boxes and all the envelopes are the same weight and you know groups of 50 and so on. If you can do that to them and you just hand them these boxes, they'll give you a better rate. So we have customers who you know easily within the first year are getting their money back just on postal savings um, if they get through that. So that's one of the big ones. Um, same thing with the envelopes. One of the customers we were at recently um, told us that they lick 60,000 envelopes a month. That's not how many they send. I mean, they send millions of documents a month. But they get 60,000 a month on average that are rejected by this machine because some sheet got missed or it's too light or something. Something didn't go right. And they get these out of the pile and they don't have any way of dealing with those because the system already output them. So they have to find the pieces, put them in the envelope manually, and then lift them themselves and put them in. So at the moment, we're working to add something so that we can scan it with a barcode reader um, when it comes out the other end, and then we can automatically reprint and have it go through the process of um, uh, personalization and cross-marketing, as I said, um, is a value for them. The other thing that we do is we don't do any scripting. So most of the competing products force you to have some kind of language that you can you script basically what happens. Um, and we have everything, um, there's an interface for describing rules and what you want to happen and that kind of thing. And so it's not targeted at you know business user. It's not the CEO sitting at his desk doing it, but uh, you don't have to be a programmer. You don't have to be your IT department involved necessarily to set up a new, um, a new output that you want to do. Um, and the other thing is obviously for legacy systems. So if you don't want to go in and 
change the systems that you have. This is a nice way, in a lot of cases, of being able to overlay something on top, um, reconfigure and put things together and that kind of thing. So that's the product. And now on to the main topic, which is the challenges. So um, when I was trying to do this talk, I was trying to think about, well, what were the problems and what were the causes, and it started to get really confusing because everything, different things related to different things, and I was kind of going around in circles. So I started drawing it out. Um, and I thought fundamentally the thing that was killing me when I started was slow development. It just like it took me a really long time to do the things that I wanted to do. And the main things that seemed to be contributing to that were that the tests were slow and hard to run, um, and that getting an image was slow and hard to run. So there were days where, you know, if I hadn't built a new image in a week or two, when I was trying to build it, I'd run into problems, and we didn't integrate, and the dependency was needed, and I might spend three hours trying to get an image that everything loved it. Obviously not very efficient. Um, the test seemed to be slow and hard to run largely because we were getting um, false positives and because it wasn't always clear what was a unit and what was a point in the test. Um, and also because they were slow and hard to run, they weren't always run, which meant they wasn't they weren't maintained, and that meant they were even harder to run and even slower because no one was working on them all the time. Um, oh, we've done that. Let's see. Um, the fact that it was slow. Also contributed the development slow. Also contributed to the fact that um, the tests weren't getting updated because you just didn't have time, and because they weren't updated, you were getting more false positives, of course. But the main reason that you're getting false positives is that the test environment wasn't reproducible. So um, we had, um, as I said, not not a very clear separation. You didn't know which tests you could run without having everything set up, and having everything set up meant you needed configuration files, you needed external components that were being run. Um, they had to be configured correctly, the host names, the port numbers that had to match, and so on. Um, and you know, the test data might have changed, you didn't know if you had the right version, someone might have added something. It was just kind of a big mess. Um, and you know, all of that was, was a big manual process. So even when you thought you'd done it right, it was possible to get it. Um, the tests, uh, because the Tests weren't always run. You also didn't have confidence in the in the automated. You weren't getting that confidence from the automated tests all the time, and because they were slow and I couldn't always get them running. There was one person who was the original developer, and he could always get them running. Um, he was doing mostly integration. He tended to have a system that was up to date and could run the tests, um, and so that meant that he ended up doing all the integrating, um, and that meant that we didn't integrate as frequently because he was often working on something he didn't have time to integrate my work, so it would sit for a few days or a few weeks or you know, longer sometimes. Um, and because we were doing it very often, it was harder. Um, and because it was harder, and again, he was doing it, so we're kind of going in loops. And you just start to see these loops going around, and it's just a vicious circle. It gets the slower and messier and harder. Um, and then in the end, the fact that you're not getting this confidence boost out of knowing that unit tests are passing, combined with the fact that we were doing frequent releases, so we were probably on average trying to deliver to customers every three to four weeks, I would say on average. I mean, sometimes it would be several, it would be every week, other times it might be a couple months, but on average it's probably in that frequency. So those two combinations meant stress. Um, every time it came up to a delivery, um, you know, you're racing to try to establish, yes, everything still works. There was a lot of manual uh, testing to be done, and you know, just didn't have that complete confidence that you have if your unit test suite was passing, is still passing, you know, things aren't broken. Uh, and so, having sort of drawn this out, trying to figure things out, I noticed there were a bunch of things that didn't have any obvious causes that I'd written down. And it turns out that those were actually a lot of things that I was trying to focus on anyway. So, that made me happy. I feel like I was, you know, I must have gone through this sometimes, even though I didn't draw it out. Um, and so those are the those are the things that I've been trying to focus on over the last few months as I'm trying to improve uh, this process. Um, so focusing on making building images easier so that you can do that um, with no effort on your part as often as possible. Um, I'm making the tests easier to run and I'm making integration easier and which is less pain. So continuous delivery um, is I guess a slightly broader definition than continuous integration, although continuous integration is probably the biggest part of it. Um, and continuous integration is this idea that every
every time you publish a version, every time you submit, you run a build, you run your test, um, and so you know for every build and status. And the goal is to get feedback as quickly as possible. Continuous delivery, as I say, is largely that, but it goes a little bit further, and it tries to automate the whole process right through to delivering to the customer or to installing onto your production servers. Uh, so most of the big, um, you know, Twitter and all those guys are all doing this to the point that they often have automatic or nearly automatic processes rolling out new versions often several times a day onto their production servers. And they're confident doing that because each build has gone through a series of gateways to pass the unit test, to pass the functional test, to pass, um, it's been installed and someone's done some manual verification on it and they have monitoring and so on and so on. And it progresses first to a few servers and then to a few more and assuming everything works it eventually just gets propagated. So that's kind of the end goal of that. Um, and the, so the hope in our case is that every build is potentially releasable. Uh, and the, you know, whoever's making a decision about that, whether it's uh, product management or whoever, should be able to grab any version um, built off the server, install it, test it, think, yep, this looks good, we're going to send this one out, and they should be able to press a button, basically, and it gets uploaded into or you know, whatever goes out, ready for users to use. And then you have the confidence through repeating this process that every version is ready to do that. Um, and the goal of doing that quickly is really to get, um, is to realize the business value from your ideas as quickly as possible, to reduce the time from, ooh, I have an idea, to let's get it to customers where they're seeing value, where they're paying us for it. Um, so we don't have these ideas sitting for six months, 12 months, not doing anything any good. Um, this is kind of the book on continuous delivery. Um, it is a very interesting read. It is, I think, short on technical details of the implementation. You read it and you think, oh, that's an excellent idea. How do I actually do that? Um, I think it's one of those books that's written by people who want to come in and do consulting for you. Yes? Why do they have Walkthrough on there that mentioned in the book? Yes, they do mention it. Um, I can't quite remember why they wanted a bridge. They wanted a different bridge, but it was already used, already scheduled to be used for another book. And then they settled on the fourth grade as the second choice. But I can't quite remember why they specifically wanted a bridge. It's guess, but I'm guessing it's because I'm guessing it's because the fourth bridge notoriously used to be endlessly painted. It took exactly how okay. long to paint it as you needed to repaint it for seven years. Right, yeah, you get to the end and you go back and you start painting again. <laughs> yeah, that maybe that is it. But there is a page in there that explains it. Um, so I do recommend the book. It's not gonna give you all the answers. Um, and I'm finding, even online, it's quite hard to find, everyone talks about doing it, it's quite hard to find when you actually think, well, okay, now I need to do this, and I have a Windows system, and I need to install that, automate that. It's quite difficult to find details, and when you throw the fact that you're doing it in small time, there's very little details about that, so, um, worth having nonetheless. So, um, a quick summary of continuous delivery. Uh, the goal, as I said, is really to, uh, to minimize that cycle time and to make sure that you're increasing the quality of your software continuously and that you're able to do that in a repeatable and guaranteed way. Um, you're not locking into quality, you are repeatedly demonstrating that you can deliver that so that you, you build confidence. Um, and the primary thing that you want to do in it is doing frequent automated releases. So we were doing frequent releases, which is good, um, but you need the automated to get these benefits which is decreased stress, um, because you know every time you do it, you, there's no last minute on Friday or you get those things integrated to release it. Um, you're just integrating every day, and the builds are being made, and you pick one day and release it. Um, you're improving auditability because your processes aren't, you know, you're scripted, they're logged, they're done exactly the same way every way, you're not introducing human error in that process. So you can go back and say, well, I know that version went in, I know those tests were run. Um, you can guarantee that it wasn't mixed, but it's automated. Um, and you want to try to get feedback as quickly as possible. So the, the idea is, you know, first step is often that you automate it, but you run it yourself. But you really want to get to the point where every time you commit, this process kicks off. And the goal is to get as much feedback as quickly as possible. So you want to get, um, you want to run some, you want to run your unit tests immediately after you commit. And you want to get, okay, let's pass, that's fine. And then you want to run a couple of smokescreen tests that tell you, um, okay, I can start it, I can make a connection, it looks like it probably is okay. 
And at that point, maybe you can say, well, that integration is OK. I'm going to go on and start working on something else. And then meanwhile, functional tests kick off. And maybe those take half an hour. Maybe they take a couple of hours. But as soon as possible, you get a result from that as well. And you say, OK, we can pass for fine. Um, and one of the tenets is basically if the build breaks, you drop everything. You have to go back and get that build working. Um, and so you want to do that as soon as possible after breaking it because you remember what you did. You don't want to face a week later and go, oh, what was that change that I made? Um, you, by automating, you're removing the dependency on having one person who knows, who knows how to do the build. Uh, that knowledge is, um, well, say, A, it's transferable because anyone can go look at scripts, you know it's not in their head. Um, and B, it doesn't even really have to be transferable most of the time because it's just a press of a button. And so a new developer, you know, when I came online, it was a lot of learning, and as I said, it taking me three hours sometimes to try to get an image built. Um, once I'm finished what I'm doing, Scale. I would make some change and have another branch ready to integrate, but then 
you know, something would come up where you have to fix some bugs and so on, and a month later you go to try to integrate that and then you just get conflicts all over the place. Um, and you, you forget why you did things and so on. So it's very hard to check that the integration was successful. Uh, we've had, I think, fairly poor visibility of changes, so you didn't know what other people were working on necessarily, and um, you'd get caught out, you know, just not necessarily duplicating, but um, having, doing stuff that overlapped and maybe you could have avoided that. Um, and it was hard to predict and hard to analyze failures. So when you had test failures, it was hard to know, well, uh, you know, if, if I corrupted my environment in some way, is there some change that's needed to the environment by new code that I loaded, uh, or did the person who last committed just not on the test? Uh, or have you just broken something in the code now? And you, just, you couldn't be sure why the tests were failing, so you wasted a lot of time trying to figure that out. Um, so we started, you know, taking small steps to try to improve some of this stuff. Um, we started using uh, an issue tracker. This is the um, this is Mars, which is the issue tracker that the small talk engineering team uses. So we tried to reuse stuff that um, other people in the organization were using as much as possible. Um, and it's fairly simple, but just allowed us a way of tracking um, what people were working on with numbers and so on. And we would get emails of what, what was being done, which was possibly even more important. Um, and then the engineering uses another tool um, that to take the numbers from this and um, sort of half automate the process of uh, tracking which, uh, when you make a commit, which uh, issue you're working on, and also then helping you guide you through the merge process so you can easily select, you just type in the number that you're working on, and it'll bring up a list of all the package versions that are tagged with that.
and then if you implement the new version that has a second concrete implementation of that abstraction, so that you can then switch it over. And then at the end, you can either keep the abstraction if it seems useful, or you can throw it away. Um, and I've certainly used the idea of um, abstracting something out so you can write another version, but this idea of doing it with the intentional realization that you might just then remove the abstraction again at the end of the line and back together is kind of an interesting one. But it means you can again be committing on this new version and nobody's using it until you swap over the implementation. And then finally, using components to, to decouple. And we do do that. We have uh, four or five kind of major component systems. And that means that you can be working on one part uh, without uh, conflicting with someone else as much. I mean, you still need to be committing things that don't break the build, uh, but you're not getting the version as well. So, remaining issues in this area, I think we're doing fairly well on those. Um, restructurings are still nasty. You know, if you're moving stuff between packages, you're renaming classes, and so on. Um, we have that tool I was talking about. You're essentially making a branch every time you commit one of those packages with the um, with the issue number in it, because you're not we don't just create the back into the main line until someone does that. So ideally, you do those even to create them the same day or whatever. You do it fairly quickly, but for some period of time, you're a branch. And if someone else is making any changes at all during that time, and your chain is involved in a major restructuring, then the mergers are still uh, can still be ugly. I don't really have found much of a solution for that other than just trying to be aware of it. And the other one, which I think is a fairly minor point that we're still running into a bit, is um, not having a formal integration token. A lot of people, if you're working in an office, have a stuffed monkey or something, uh, or a wand or a sword, and you have to have that if you're integrated. And that means that you don't have two people integrating at once. Um, we are a distributed team, so we don't have that. And at the moment, we still have an informal process where you, you know, go on Skype and say, hey, are you integrating? Can I integrate? Yeah, most of it works, but sometimes they're not online or they integrated and they forgot to upload the version or whatever, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't work perfectly. Um, building issues. Um, so we had we were doing manual builds and they were being run on the developer machines. So um, you are, first of all, using a lot of developer time doing them because they're doing it by hand, and you get problems where someone comes on and they say, oh, I can't get an image to build. And I said, well, I will. Here you can my image. But you know, at that point you don't know where it came from, you don't know what's been loaded, you can't reproduce it, you're now passing this image around and you can't get the state back, you're just delaying fixing that problem. Uh, you take shortcuts, it's a bit like going back to the C, um, having a compile cycle, and you think, oh, I don't want to build another image, I'll just do, I'll do three fixes in this, or um, I'll have a test so it takes so long to run, I'll make a couple of changes and then I'll run the test and see if they pass. And it's a bit like having to go back and submit your work at the end of the day and come back in the morning and check what's been filed. Uh, and then you can just work some my machine effect, which I think is just a killer. Uh, you load someone's new code and it breaks, and you say, hey, you know, it's not working. It's like, well, it works for me. Well, what good does that do me, right? So, um, again, we've taken some steps to move towards that. I guess the kind of first step was to at least have some helper scripts to help the process and have a written written script, a documented script that a person can follow, so that theoretically anybody can follow those steps and get an image, and you know you're not missing steps. But it's still manual, it still takes time, and there's still the risk that you make a mistake, you forget something, or you do it wrong. Um, next step on from that was to uh, fully automate those scripts, and we're basically done that now for the development images. So I said there's four or five components, and I've got each of those automated. And at the moment, we've settled on a system we have. I started main on in batch files when building on Windows, and I was running batch files. And uh, we decided to try to move into small talk because that's what everyone was using anyway, and it gave us obviously more power than, than using the batch files. Um, so we have a builder image which is in small talk, and we write um, a method basically for each build step. And that then, when it gets triggered, writes that method out uh, as a script. Uh, it also writes out a wrapper script, and the wrapper script um, has a whole bunch of um, catching errors and that kind of thing. Um, we then take uh, Jenkins, which is our the um, automation server we're using. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we'll check from that. We'll check an image out from that, which is usually an image that's been generated from an earlier build. So we'll have um, the very first build takes a VisualWorks image out of VisualWorks install directory, loads a whole bunch of. Um, fixes and resolutions into it, saves that. So 
the next step that's going to build our kind of product base image checks the latest version that's passed all the tests of that image, copies it into the working directory, and then the builder will um, start up that image passing in the name of the wrapper script. The target image loads the wrapper script, and the wrapper script contains commands to load the other script in. I say it wraps that with some error handlers and so on, so that uh, if there's an error in the build, it basically exits the image at the moment. And what I, my next step is to have it save the image, uh, and then exit, and you know, have a debugger open and so on, so that you can then open it and see what's wrong. Um, the builds are run now uh, at least daily by Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins is a Java-based open source product uh, for running uh, for doing this continuous integration. And as I said, what you want is for it to run on every commit. Uh, at the moment, we have, so some of our configuration is in Subversion, all of our code is in Smalltalk, and the build script is in Smalltalk. So at the moment, anything that's in Subversion will trigger a new build if it changes. So if you commit a new version of uh, the configuration files or anything like that, a build will automatically happen, and that's because that's built into Jenkins. I haven't yet done the piece to, to check in store to see when there's a new version. I don't think it'll be too hard. But they do run every night we get uh, we can see in the morning what's what's built and if it's uh, passed successfully. And then each of those, uh, the what are called the arch or the artifacts of those builds are archived. So you can see here this was build 32 of the engine component and we've archived the image that came as file and the next most few that were generated from that. So you can go back through any version and pull those down as you need. Um, so these are taken from uh, a white paper, which I'll give you the link to on the next slide. And you don't really have to read it all right now, but what they've basically done is gone through, um, this is talking about continuous integration, um, gone through and looked at what different companies are doing, and they've sort of grouped them into levels of uh, aptitude along the scale, how much are you doing. And the uh, sort of cog icon up there above introductory is uh, marked as the sort of industry norm, that's what most people have got to that level, and the one with the arrow is the target, which is where they think that people should be aiming. And obviously going beyond that is getting into people like Twitter and Facebook that have really fully automated this. So I think at the moment right now, we've got most of the introductory stuff there, and I'm working on that novice level, so I'd say we're in about there right now, and I'm aiming to get us into there. Most of the intermediate stuff we want, and I really want to be tracking big changes. So we're off around there. Still to do, uh, so I want to get it running automatically on all code changes so that that's fired off immediately or as close to immediately as possible. I'm trying to avoid the version split and subversion, so store has a way of storing files in it, but um, I'm not totally happy with how that works and I'm a little reluctant to put 100 megs of test data into that database. I'm not sure what it's going to do. So, not quite sure the solution, but you run into this problem obviously where you have two different versioning systems and you need to know, well, I checked out that version of that and that version of that. Um, we better just have a single system. Uh, and then there's a build uh, version numbering question. Most people will put the build number from their server, from the build server, into the version number because you really, knowing the version of the code isn't enough. You, know, you can run the build twice with the same version of the code, but the configuration might have changed. And so if you're distributing you know, version 123 of the code to a customer, but you built it two different ways with two different configurations, you really need to know which was the one that was shipped. So if you include the build number, build server in it, then you can look up exactly, you can go to the logs and see exactly what's going on. So this is the link to the white paper here if you're interested. Um, you can come up and ask me later if you don't want to write it down and look for the slides. Um, I think it's worth worth a read. It's only 10 or 12 pages. Um, so testing. Um, when I started the test week, it would take 16 hours to run. Um, and the environment was hard to create, so I could rarely get to a point where I could run the tests. Uh, I would usually do a bunch of work, and then that's someone else who ended up working to run them for me overnight. Um, the test would sometimes pass again when you ran them a second time, so obviously you know, it was dependent on the order that they were run. Something else was, was leaving the environment in a state that would make it pass, um, which meant that not everyone could, could be sure of the results, and it was expensive to maintain, and often, uh, often it would be easier just to have someone manually run through the system and make sure it was more or less working than trying to get all the test environments set up, which was not ideal. So 
um, the first thing we did was to try to optimize that down. We did a bunch of caching and a bunch of network optimization and a bunch of stuff that brought that from 16 hours down to two. We also ran it on a dedicated server that was uh, slightly higher performance, so that helped. Um, and then we separated the unit tests or the regression tests, I should say, from the functional uh, integration tests. And our, what I'm saying are regression tests. Sort of supposed to be unit tests, but some of them are still too dependent on external systems for my liking, so they're a bit slow and a bit, um, you know, they still sometimes fail because you didn't put a file in the right place. Um, and so that means we can now run that subset, which takes, you know, I think I'm, it's about 25 minutes or half an hour to run those tests, which is another big improvement. And we've got the data, the test data is now stored centrally so that you can always go there and get the newest version and everyone knows if you don't put changes in there. Um, I'm working at the moment, I'm nearly done getting the tests to run automatically. I think actually they are running automatically, but one of the tests is getting a sound core or something, and so it's not complete. I'm nearly done. This is a slide from the Seaside project um, where we've also got um, a lot of this set up. Uh, and so this is running, I'm showing the results of the test run for each build. Uh, the bottom, down the bottom is the unit test, up the top is the lint run. Uh, and you can see the last two builds there, there's just a little bit of red down at the bottom, so there's a failing test which just appeared in those builds, so you can see the history of how many tests are passing failing, and you can configure it to send you an email whenever something fails and so on. So that's really there now. So looking at testing, um, again I'd say we're you know beyond beyond introductory but not really into novice yet. And similarly I'm aiming for about the same beyond beyond the intermediate. Um, the next bit is to get the regression tests running automatically as well as the unit tests. to get the regression test, finish getting the regression test running and to get a couple of smoke tests, which is just a couple of tests very quickly to tell you that it looks like things are running. Uh, then we can go and do something else. Uh, then we get a functional test to run and to make sure that our version, that we version the, the test data. It's not just in a directory, some of actually version. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to automate the creation of the test environments and setting up the dependencies, um, you know, starting VMs with things running on the right port and so on if needed. So that's really just push button, completely push button to run the test. And then finally, releasing. Um, the main problem there is that we had one person who was doing it, and they were doing it. That person was the best person to do the build, and the best person to do the integration. And so when you were needing to do builds, integration wasn't happening, and when you were needing to do integration, the builds would get delayed. Um, and then also, as we get close to release, um, you end up having that you know, a couple of weeks where, well, we're getting close to release, we don't introduce anything that's going to break, so suddenly we start branching. And then two or three weeks later, you go to try to merge that stuff, and stuff's changed. Um, because several people have been working on different branches, and they don't integrate them. So we haven't done much there yet. This is kind of last on my list. We, we do have some helper scripts, so it's sort of semi-automated. It's still someone running through manually, but they're again following a script, and some of the steps are, are done for them. Um, which puts us firmly industry norm, yes. Um, but we still have a way to go. So I definitely would like to get um, the image, the production images built automatically. Um, also the creation of the installers, um, installer executables, bundling everything up, and um, installation into a test environment so that you know our product manager can say, okay, well what's what's been done this week? Hit a button, get an installer, get a version installed on VM somewhere that they can go and test, and it would be you know, just a single click. Um, and uh, you know, so I'd also like to get ideally some kind of change log generation done automatically, because that's another big manual process is gathering all that information for each work. So, um, and then the final step there, which which we may look at, is having a final um, sort of button click by someone who's done manual testing, thinks that everything's working okay, wants to make this release available to customers. Hit a button and then that installer gets uploaded to an FTP site basically so that they can download it. Um, I don't think we'll be doing that automatically, but some people will do that as well. So, there we go, that's it. Two minutes left. Questions? Uh, we have a microphone that can be taken back to this area. Craig? How's your stress level? <laughs> um, well, right now it's a little higher, but um, it's definitely improved. So I mean, I, I can now go in in the morning, every morning, and get a new image, and that right there, my stress level is down. Um, once I can run the tests and know that I haven't broken anything, 
then my stress level is just going to be down there. Because right now, the problem is when I make a change, you know, I'm fairly confident I haven't broken anything, but I don't really know. Um, so it's not until you push it out there and get someone else running the test that you know, okay, I didn't break anything. Um, so, you know, I hate, right now I do something out at 3 p.m., but, you know, I probably don't find out until I'm on my way home on the train that I've broken it and then spend all night, you know, feeling bad and I'm going to fix it this morning. So, um, it's lower already. Questions? Here. As always, two questions. Okay. Uh, first question Do you deliver the identical software to all customers or are there customer specific? Um, uh, so, mm, it's basically the same image at this point. There are some, um, there are some bits that are kind of enabled uh, slightly differently. Thank you. 